waiting Graham Ray to hear. As we discuss, here we stand and the history of the Free Church of England, um, which is not a deeply studied subject. Waiting for Graham. Here. I'm here, Donald. How are you doing? Hi, Graham. How are you? Yeah, fine. Thank you. Yourself? Uh, doing good. I've kind of uncovered the Masonic angle. Yeah, I was listening to that this morning. FCE. Um, yeah, it was riddled. Yeah, that guy's name that I was trying to think of, who was bishop for... I think he was bishop for about 40 years uh, in Fleetwood, where Virgil is now. His name was Cyril Milner. Have you heard of him? Cyril, what is it? Cyril Milner, M-I-L-N-E-R. Oh, no. Okay, yeah. Have you heard of him? I've heard of him, but I don't know much about him. Did I'm Paul... sorry to... I'm sorry to hear... Um... Frank Vaughan was a, a Masonic, eh? a Mason. That, that's what I hear. Ah, where did you pick that up from? I'm trying to think. Somewhere along the line, if someone can clarify, I'm open to it. Um, Cyril Milner and Powell was one too, I'm told. Oh, Powell was, I know that. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure about Frank Vaughan. I've not heard that before. Um, at Fennec wrote one of my reporters in private correspondence that Freemasonry was, quote, unquote, the handmaid of the church. And also that Trevor and Ann Jordan say that he belongs to something, Burroughs, somewhere, a lodge up north. Uh -huh. Yet he That's has, finished, yeah, finished, yeah, he has. Yeah, I wouldn't been, be a bit surprised. He has what denied. Surprised? He's denied it to Arthur K. And allegedly, Bishop McLean asked several times, and Fennec always denied being a Mason, but his credibility is gone with me. So, can yeah, you start? He, he, he tell you what he wants you to know. That's and an, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Can you start us in prayer? Yeah, surely. I'm using the collect for Trinity Twelve. Okay. Almighty and everlasting God, you're always more ready to hear than we to pray, and constantly give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down on us your overflowing mercy for giving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go to she square, share screen. Okay. okay. I'm uh, on page 15 in my notes. Um, the second last paragraph on my page okay. under the heading of the birth pangs of the REC. Okay, I don't remember that, but we were on Deus Magazine. Deus Magazine. Uh, Deus Magazine. What's your last heading? Could you tell me that? Oh, I'd have to go way back up. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, got to, I got to um, uh, the, the closing sentence of the paragraph I marked was his description of the group's decision to stand on the platform of evangelicalism. 
also indicates that the biblical doctrine they held was to was prime in their thoughts, overriding any matters of liturgical practice or churchmanship and ecclesiastical polity. Have you got further than that? Uh, I, wait, I don't see it. Okay, we'll just go to where you were. Uh... Yeah. This is where we left off. When we're done, I always type in the... They're talking about... Um, this is Shuck Smith now talking about the changes that he was witnessing. And when we left off, um, where they were picking up additional sacraments beyond the 39 articles... Okay. I remember the discussion about the 35 articles, and you hadn't, hadn't heard of that, had you? Yeah, no, we did cover that. Yeah. Did, did, did you started, say... Did you started, say you hadn't... Did you ahead. say you hadn't heard of them? Yes, I have, sure. You had? Yep. Okay, so you're coming up now to Rosella and... Sanlon concluded they couldn't succeed, that right. it ignored them. Right. And you now it en ended here, 31st October. There we are. As, as, as earlier mentioned, your paragraph starts off as earlier mentioned. Huh? Is that right? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, as earlier mentioned, the pictures of the altar and the calling it by that name at Holy Communion Church in Texas, whose presbyter is a bishop of the REC, show that they've rejected the Declaration of Principles of the Reformed Episcopal Church, adopted by the founders of the denomination on December 2nd, 1873, which includes the statement... This church condemns and rejects the following erroneous and strange doctrines as contrary to God's word. This is what Fenwick has um, described as um, hasty and negative. Yeah, exactly. Third, that the Lord's table is an altar on which the oblation of the body and blood of Christ is offered anew to the Father. I conclude this section with words written in the same publication of Deus by Reverend Jonathan Richards. That's your friend, isn't it, Jonathan Richards? Yeah. He is, he's been, he's left the Reformed Episcopal Seminary allegedly over health problems, but he, he I can does. see how he'd have it. The guy must weigh four to five hundred pounds and during seminary classes would sit there and slurp down sandwiches and big bottles of iced tea with sugar in it and would wow. just read along and keep slurping and it was really kind of a put off to the students yeah, but anyways jonathan riches go ahead he was then rector of St. phillips reformed episcopal church warminster pennsylvania and an instructor at the Reformed Episcopal Seminary, Bluebell, Pennsylvania. And my, can I insert here that at St. Philip's, let me just highlight it here, in War, in Warminster, actually it was, we'd call it, um, um, Horsham, he literally took a razor, razor blade to every prayer book in the pew cutting out the Declaration of Principles. And, uh, and by whose authority did he do that, I wonder? Probably by his father, Bishop Riches. Oh. Well, if they've got a problem, they must, they must move on. They, they mustn't expect the church to move on with them. Yeah move on and out <laughs> anyway so there's um him now um in, uh, re, uh barry says we read them in the light of article five of the 35 six of the 39 
As ecumenical efforts go forward, we must lean on the foundation of scripture, tradition, and reason. Is this riches? Is this what riches is saying? Yes. Okay, that makes sense. And I didn't think Barry would say that. <laughs> the Bible is God's inspired, infallible, and inerrant what? word. How does he put those two statements together? Okay. Um, in this day, when, when the Bible is being dismissed as non-authoritative, it is extremely important for us to make clear that the foundation for the church and all Christians must rest firmly in Holy Scripture. It would be a grave mistake, however, to stop there. There is a is denial. This? That's a denial of the sufficiency of Scripture to bring so, in alongside tradition and reason. Is that what he's doing here? He's bringing in... He's bringing in tradition and reason alongside the Bible, huh? Yep. And yet he still regards the Bible as God's inspired, infallible, and inerrant word. Yes. It's, it's, it's just not sufficient. Is that what he's saying? Right. Okay, well, again, if he's not happy with our declaration of principles, then move on. Brother. Don't try and drag us all down with you. Yes. I'll pick Next. up here. here. Next current, thing, yeah. current practice and trends in the REC. And Chuck Smith was ahead of his time. The REC uh -huh. is currently engaged in becoming more united with the Anglican province of America. And I would throw out there that they are Anglo-Catholics on steroids. The best way to describe what this denomination stands for and to illustrate the doctrinal compromise, compromise involved in this growing union is to quote the words of the presiding bishop of the APA, the most Reverend H. Grundorf. On the APA website was to be found a copy of his bishop's epistle March 2nd, 2001. And before I go on with that, let me just notice, uh, Graham, that from 2000 to 2010, there was a strenuous effort on both sides to be united. That would be like the FCE trying to join with the most Anglo-Catholic body in Britain. And even David Virtue, you know, the the journalist in a private yeah. phone call with me said the other bishops, you know, on the and on the American scene, they didn't they thought it was the weirdest thing in the world to see these two groups trying to unite. So here's uh I Bishop Waller Grunsdorf, uh David Virtue called him Walter Grimbag, and I call him the same thing. <laughs> uh, married, where, where is he now? Is he still in the APA? He's retired, but married and divorced three times. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Finally, this is the Bishop Grunsdorf. A final word on, on our church and province and how we are perceived by others in and out of the continuum. I read in a recently published newsletter from one of the more insular of our continuing bodies that the APA, because of its talks and agreement with other non-Anglo-Catholic bodies, is seeking to be the low church or evangelical party of Anglicanism. This conclusion was drawn based mostly on partial or half true statements. I'll let you pick up there. The final analysis, which was drawn by this article, is that the Episcopal Church will just be another Protestant denomination bordering on Unitarianism. The APA, REC, and AMIA will be the low and evangelical Anglican body. And the church that articles writer and the church the articles writer represents would be the only unambiguously 
Anglo-Catholic body where people could go to find the fullness of the Catholic faith. This yes. definitely demonstrates... Go, go ahead. Okay, this definitely demonstrates a narrow view of what Anglicanism is, especially since the 16th century. So he, he's also got this idea that the 16th century was a, um, a mistake or that yes. it... Um, it needs to be uh, reformed. Yep. There was always been the concept of the via media in Anglicanism, which provides for an inclusiveness which is unique in this expression of Christianity. Is that an expression of Christianity, one has to ask? <laughs> the yeah. Apostle Paul would uh, beg to differ there. He'd call it an, he would call it an anathema. <laughs> yes. We have Anglo-Catholic parishes in the APA and also low church or evangelical one. But by and large, most of our congregations fall in the middle in their outward exp expression. Historically, this is where most of the churches in the Episcopal Church of the Body would have fallen, as well as the Anglican Communion as a whole. We all, however, hold dear and adhere to the formularies that have traditionally made the Anglican way unique with this adherence to the faith once delivered to the saints. That's a bit of a contradiction, isn't it? Yeah. He's just he's just told us that we're all trying to uh, encompass uh, every, every shade of opinion. Next thing he says, we hold dear to our formularies. <laughs> I, I can tell you that this grim bag is a graduate of a fundamentalist school here in the U.S. called Bob Jones University. Uh, he, got his, he got his bachelor's there, but he never studied anywhere for theology. Nowhere. Zero. Really? Yeah. That's his problem then, I guess. Eh? Well, yeah, he doesn't know his history. Or theology, because I, I know... I, I knew a priest, an APA priest, who had been Greek Orthodox. And he came to the United States and decided to join the APA. Well, he started reading the 54 volumes of the Parker Society series that was designed to rebut Anglo-Catholicism and Oxfordian theology. And as he read the English reformers, he became reformed himself. And he tried to introduce these discussions inside the APA and ran into all kinds of headwinds and jokes and mockery and laughing. Uh, he finally got out and he, he was an APA minister, priest for several years but he gave me the lowdown on what the APA was about while trying to join the REC because when I got out of the Navy I was confused and I didn't know what was going on our identity is not high church or low church Anglo-Catholic or evangelical it is Anglican period well, how about that? He's they they pray to Mary and yes. all the dif different saints. That's not Anglican, not historically. Throughout their website, this is Shuck Smith now, can be found various other evidence that their position is not that of a Reformed and Protestant denomination. In fact, all the evidence points to their being precisely the sort of denomination that George Cummins left. Yes. One, one further quote from the APA will suffice to demonstrate what kind of denomination they are. I'll let you pick up there, Graham. Our worship is centered on the Holy Eucharist or the Holy Communion, the Mass, as we affirm our faith in the real presence of our Lord's precious body and blood in the Blessed Sacrament and his re-presentation of the one perfect sacrifice in the sacrament of the altar. Well, there, 
there again, that's uh, that's the APA talking. Yeah. And the bishop. And yet, I'll say it again, in this time frame, this is what the REC was tolerating. Yeah. They threw Cummins out. Okay, I'll pick it up here. I leave it to okay. others in this book to describe the nature of ecumenical compromise, such as this proposed union with the APA evidences within the REC, and why such a path is leading away from the truth. I merely place this before you as evidence as to why we can have no further confidence in the REC and why they can no longer be called a truly evangelical church. Well, they do that on communion, uh, Graham, but they also do it on sacerdotal baptism. Yeah. I'll let the you two go together. Yeah. Yeah. The further compromise within the REC can be found in many of its actions. One of the most significant, considering the biblical position they take up on on episcopacy is to be found in their recent acceptance and signing up to the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, which contains the following statement that once again forces us to ask about the true churchmanship and doctrinal position of the current REC. As inherent parts of the sacred deposit, and therefore as essential, we count the following, the historic episcopate, and all that that bestows upon these gentlemen. <laughs> That's my word. <laughs> yeah. As well as being contrary to their own doctrine, though they may deny that as they have now denied their, their original okay. articles of faith, it is also a statement that runs contrary to Article 35 of the Free Church of England, the state, that doctrine of apostolic succession by which is taught that the ministry of the Christian church must be derived through a series of uninterrupted ordinations from the apostles themselves. And without the same, there can be no Christian church, no valid ministry, and no administration of the sacraments has no foundation in Scripture and is productive of great mischief, as we are witnessing in our ranks. Um, is that the view of Bennett on apostolic succession? What is his view? Um, well, he um, he's dis he he again throws it into the realm of the enigmatic, and therefore, um, no one can really say what it is or what it achieves. That, that's his statement. I'm almost quoting him verbatim there. He says, "No one is too sure what it actually is." and what it bestows on the recipients. How that, negative doesn't stop it, how negative from, <laughs> that doesn't stop him from uh, highly commending it and basing most of his dictatorial attitude upon it. Yeah. He's convinced he's an apostle. <laughs> yeah. This brief section will simply consist of a list of issues that have come up in the current REC with no further comment from myself, but that underline further the reasons we have no confidence in the REC as an evangelical book. Fennec's book, 28, leans heavily on the REC for justification of what he claims the FCE is about. These are some points that demonstrate why this position is not acceptable to us and not, in my opinion, true to the original purpose and doctrine of the REC in the USA. I'll let you pick up there. The, number one, the new Book of Common Prayer, currently being trailed by the REC, contains in the Holy Baptism Service for Infants the words, Seeing now, dearly beloved brethren, that this child or this person is regenerate, 
too. The that, same book now. Yeah. Graham, that was a big deal to Cummins to change that. It was yeah. a big deal with Bishop Shaney in Chicago. In fact, it was one of the foundational principles. Yeah. It's um it's contrary to the um articles too, isn't it? The the thirty-nine articles. Uh is that in the in the in the sixteen sixty two or in the FCE that denies that? Well that's that's what he's saying there. Um yeah. of the sacraments. What is it the um Baptism, baptism, Article 27 says, Baptism is not only a sign of profession and mark of difference, whereby Christian men are discerned from others that be not Christian, christened, but it is also a sign of regeneration or new birth, whereby, as by an instrument, they that receive baptism rightly are grafted into the church. Well, that's a bit uh, open to... That's a bit open to um, misinterpretation as well, isn't it? Yeah. The idea that uh, it's um, a sign of regeneration. It's not actually saying that they are regenerate. What all, of this, all of this stuff was going on back door. And a lot of people in the pew were not aware of what was going on. And there was quite a consternation on this side of the pond. Now, I think most of those people have all left. Um, and a new generation has arisen that is kind of more, you know, they get the twinkle in the eye for the clothes and the uh, fripperies of the fops. Um, but you're not allowed to bring too much Reformed theology with you when you join them today. Yeah. Uh, they don't like that. Because it's made up of a lot of these ex-evangelicals who were unhappy with their empty backgrounds and who joined up, including some Charismatics and Pentecostals. And There's a guy yeah. up in Philadelphia who's a real hothead um, about Reformed theology, Calvinistic theology. He hates the idea that it, there's still a pocket or two where it is permitted. Yeah, is he the guy that you were quoting the other day as, um, no, I think it was um, Barry, um, uh, Barry du, uh, Barry was saying Roger de Barry was saying that um, he he was kind of almost regarding it as as, as blasphemy, the idea of uh, predestination and election. Uh, forget now. Um, yeah, forget. Well, we pick up here the same book. Yeah, it's. Um, Carry on there, number three. Are we on three, aren't we? No, we're on two. The same book now contains a list of colics, epistles, and gospels for holy days, including St. Andrew, the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. All Saints Day, Independence Day, and Thanksgiving Day. Three, the Anglican Communion Network, announced the alliance of six Anglican groups joined in a pledge to be a missionary movement of Anglicans in fellowship with global Anglicanism, making disciples who make disciples of Jesus Christ in North America and to the ends of the earth. The alliance is comprised of the Reformed Episcopal Church, REC, the Anglican Mission in America, AMIA, Forward in Faith North America, FIFNA, the Anglican Province in America, APA, and the American Anglican Council, AAC, AAC as well now, as epistle signatories from the ECUSA. Okay, this group here was soft Pentecostal. These okay. next three groups 
were Anglo-Catholics. And I do mean Anglo, these next two groups. Right. But all of them got together in the early 2000 period to be, to form this AAC group. Right. Uh, I'll pick up here. The official news of the ACNA is available at this website. The following statements come from Anglican belief and practice. The joint affirmation of the Reformed Episcopal Church and the Anglican province of America. And I can tell you that by this, by this year, 2001, Shifty Sutton was teaching bread worship and use of the rosary and baptismal justification. I have that upon the word of a few students who studied with him and were confused by it. So let's, uh, let's see what this joint affirmation has to tell us. Um, if you want to pick it up there. Okay. Baptism. It is through baptism by water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of, of the Holy Ghost that an individual <laughs> dies to sin and rises to new life in Christ. Through this rebirth or regeneration, baptism washes away original sin and opens the door to God's grace. At baptism, a person is grafted into the church, the body of Christ, becomes a church, a branch of the vine. Furthermore, in baptism, a visible confirmation is given of God's forgiveness of the individual's sins, the one's adoption as a son of God and an heir of salvation. By which, uh, that is, someone, go ahead. Someone, someone Riley commented that if that was the case, then uh, the whole of Britain would be a large proportion of the British population would have all those benefits from it because they, they've mostly been baptized at some point or another yeah but they certainly are not a branch of the vine nor are they um, recipients of grace this is Romanism out and out through yep. and through it is in direct conflict with Shaney and Cummins whether you like yeah. those men or not, that's what they believed. And this is a contradiction of that. And I blame Leonard Riches for being the, the driver of this and throwing his theology away. What Because he taught us that baptism, a person may be regenerated, but not necessarily. It's not necessarily tied to the sign. That regeneration is a sovereign, supernatural miracle of God alone. And may that may occur without baptism or later in someone's life. And then like you're noting, there's many who are baptized who don't have any divine life at all. Yeah. And yet here's Leonard Riches and Shifty Sutton totally overthrowing the, this one point in the Declaration of Principles. Now, for the listeners who are tuning in, at least this much, Graham and I are trying to be honest, as is Chuck Smith. And whether you agree or disagree isn't the issue. The issue is we're getting at the facts and that the top leaders of the Reformed Episcopal Church were playing games and deceiving people and going back to Roman sacramentology. This is a joint statement now of the Reformed Episcopal Church. And see that 2001? I was just getting out of the Navy and I didn't know what was going on with my church. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll continue on. Quote, affirmation, it is therefore affirmed that Christ directly instituted only two sacraments, baptism and the Eucharist, for use in the church, by, which, by means of which people 
partake of the mystery of the incarnation. These two sacraments are rightly considered generally necessary for salvation. Furthermore, the church orders her life sacramentally in services, rites, and signs that are rooted in the baptismal and Eucharistic mysteries. The church through these ministrations is the instrument and channel of God's grace. And I would say, no, it is not. It's simply the, the proclaimer of it. God is the instrument of grace. Mm -hmm. For this reason, mm -hmm. it is permissible within Anglicanism to refer to the rites and ceremonies of confirmation, penance, matrimony, ordination, and unction as minor or lesser sacraments. Well, you know, this, this, this is the um, this view of the church is tying in with the the idea that bishops are acting as apostles, you know, because they the apostles had that um, great privilege of being able to through preaching the gospel, mind you, not through some kind of um, ritual, but through preaching the gospel, they had the privilege of seeing. The Holy Spirit poured out in great measure. But uh, these guys are imagining that by their going through the sacraments, performing the sacrament ritual, they are bestowing the Holy Spirit on the church. Yeah, and we owe it to Barry Shucksmith for his preservation of the record. Now, he's not with us anymore. But though he's gone, he has done us a great favor in yeah. preserving the record. Yeah. Now, for the listeners, again, we are facing the dishonesty of Bishop Leonard Riches, the dishonesty of Bishop Shifty Sutton, and the compliance and probably ignorance of what I call Lieutenant Grote. Bishop Royal Grote. Um, I call him a lieutenant because he was not the sharpest blade in the toolkit. <laughs> well, if you'll pick up there. The following are apparently words of Charles Edward Cheney, one of the founders of the REC, and the first new bishop of the REC. They are not footnoted as I was sent them in a letter from the USA and cannot trace them in my own books and research. I warn you that this, this is now a quote from Cheney. I warn you that the same fear of offending members of the church from which this church separated because of false doctrine and theatrical worship inculcating that doctrine is likely to be the temptation of our ministers, vestries and congregations in time to come. Resist that temptation. Allow nothing in the church that can create the impression that you are striving to conceal the impassable gulf separating us from the Anglican church as it is in the present day. Omit nothing which will make it manifest that we are first of all Christians, next evangelical and Protestant Christians. So that's uh, Chidi's warning. I remember this being repeated by Bishop Higgins, and I got it by way of a hand-me-down from somebody who was a student with him who says exactly the same thing, that the RECs would ever be tempted to false doctrine and theatrical worship, and he warned them. This is the 1960s and 1970s to resist yeah. that temptation. Yeah. It's like um, Cummins said as well concerning the uh, the robes and the vestments. You know, yeah. the, the, more, the more elaborate the vestments, the more um, the wearer of those garments is... Um, feeding his pride and arrogance. Yeah. I'll go ahead with the conclusion. 
sector. Conclusion. The original founders of the REC set up a truly evangelical denomination. In the last few years, this has been thrown away in the search for some form of visible unity, most probably as a part desire to be involved in the modern and unbiblical ecumenical movement. The denomination hierarchy seems now to be more worried about its place on the world stage and how it could be friends with other churches than with upholding the reform doctrines of its beginning. We can no longer have confidence or fellowship with a denomination that has returned to the very practices that were so abhorrent to its founders. And, and what one might add there, the fact that um, that was why they founded these churches. That's why the FCE and the REC were founded, because of their abhorrence with you know, the uh, doctrines of the, of the mother church. Had they remained faithful, they could have been a solid refuge for reformed Christians who want a prayer book. Yeah. You know, who are confessional Calvinists, evangelicals, unabashed Protestants, Fran Marians, but that can no longer be promised to someone wanting to join them. They've given yeah. up their birthright. Now, Dr. Alan Gelzo, who was there in the 90s as this was happening, told me, and he was my professor, still alive, up at uh, Princeton, heading up a think tank. He told me that Leonard Rich's version of evangelism and church growth consisted in picking up straggling, Anglo-Catholic churches and missions. That's in the 90s. I didn't know that. I was at sea. Um, I do know that uh, two professors, Professor, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank, and Professor Milton Fisher, the two of them had a personal phone call with Leonard Riches in 1994 in which Leonard Riches repeated what we read earlier about baptismal regeneration. So very early, um, he was chucking the Declaration of Principles before anybody knew it. And then it's his son, you know, I call him Razor Blades, who cut out the Declaration of Principles from all the prayer books. And this is a six, and, and both these professors in this three way phone call agreed that the very next day they pulled their ministry licenses or they changed denomination and they both went Presbyterian um, and quit. The reform, and they were both professors and quit. Yeah. And one of them at age 94 is still alive, is alert, and is still teaching out in a seminary in Colorado. Wow. So, so those guys didn't feel that they could stand up to Richards and Sutton and Throat, eh? I guess not. I wonder what uh, convinces them that um, they've got to abandon ship. You know, it, it is a it is a temptation, I think, to abandon ship, isn't it, and just yeah, leave it to the liberals. Yeah, exactly. I I'm with you. They should have stayed and fought. Of all things, as professors, and to have alerted yeah. the denomination. I totally the agree. With is, you. The the thing is, they they owe it not just to themselves to be true to their own conscience, but they owe it to the denomination as well. Precisely. You know, they they are the. Um, they, they, in a sense, are in the driving seat of the denomination 
and what they say or well, where they take the denominator, where they lead, is where the denomination is going to go. And if they just abandon ship, they're, ba they're virtually handing over to the um, Anglo-Catholics, aren't they? Yeah. Which is what's yeah. happened with us here. They're, they're, um, they're perceived to be the voice of the denomination. Fennec and Hunt and, uh, and uh, this chap, Bob Stevens, they are regarded as the, the spokesman for the church. Meanwhile, they're, they're actually, they've got serious problems with the basic foundation <laughs> principles of the denomination. They've, they've got, actually, if they were honest and true, they would uh, admit that they're not actually entitled to um, have that position in the denomination at all. Yeah, they hijacked the denomination and the money. Yeah. Well, they talk, uh, they, they jo jovially talk in, in England about um, ministers coming into the Church of England with their fingers crossed. You know, when, when they swear allegiance to the 39 articles, they cross their fingers as if that uh, absolves them from their hypocrisy. As if God doesn't care. Yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and read this next section. Okay. When the REC was set up, there were many letters of support and prayer to Bishop Cummins by individual members of the FCE and also by the official FCE itself. Messages of pride and pleasure that others had also stood up against ritualism against errant doctrines such as baptismal regeneration and the idea of three distinct orders within ministry and had stepped away from the compromised Protestant and Episcopal Church. I'll let you pick up there. These doctrines and practices have now been returned to, albeit cloaked in clever language and confusing smoke screens. However, when a congregation of the REC cannot get a straight answer from their bishop to the question, what is the status of an unbaptized adult who has made a sincere profession of faith in Jesus Christ, they've clearly made a significant movement in their doctrinal position. They are now in a position in which we cannot possibly say we have fellowship with them or confidence in what they stand for. Okay, and that and seems to be Shuck Smith's conclusion. Yeah, then we've got all his uh, all these footnotes. Footnotes, yeah. Um, I think that was chapter three we were in. No, chapter two. Yeah, it's two. Um well, maybe we should end it there before we pick up Chapter 3. Yeah. Is that okay with you? That's fine, uh, Don. Yeah. Okay, let us close in prayer. Just just, um, just to think, uh, going back to um, Freemasonry, um, uh, before we, we close off in prayer, just um, thinking through... What um, what would be a good way to challenge a mason, whether he's a, a clergyman or whether he's a layman? Uh, what would be a good way to witness to a Freemason? Have you have you um, got any thoughts on that? I would say, tell me about the theology of masonry. Dig right. deep. I would be aiming to educate, educate, educate. And let them know that it definitely is a theology and that it has universalism and justification by character and good works. Uh, yeah. It's not the gospel as we've been talking about it. So, so they, and, they deny that, do they? they? They deny that it has a theology or that it's, uh, it's got a, a religious um, purpose. 
Some do deny that, but I think they're misinformed, uninformed, uneducated. Yes. And there's enough literature out there to expose that. Yeah, uh, they believe my, my dad was my dad was a mason, and when I challenged him on that score, you know, asking him whether it was a church or a religion, he said uh, he made a distinction between it being a society of secrets uh, rather than a secret society. I don't know quite how he, what he meant by that, but. Um, Apparently, a, a society of secrets is something permissible, but a secret society is something a bit more ominous. Well, they believe self, all roads lead to God, be it Muslims, Islam, Buddha, Hindu, or any yeah. of the pagan deities of old. Yes, they, they've got plenty of uh, Bible verses in their liturgies, but they exclude the name of Jesus so yeah. that, and that the Bible is on the same level as the Quran. So yeah. and when you pledge secrecy on those things, you are doing the very opposite of the ninth commandment that requires that you speak the truth openly yeah. and freely. And I think, and I think the, um, the actual, uh, purpose of them having all these secrets has a bit of a tie in with um, one degree where they actually reveal the name of the great architect and that name I think they called it the golden the golden uh, sets level or something like that the golden arch something like that and at that level, they reveal to the initiates that the name of the deity uh, that mason masonry represents is Ja Ru Bao, which is a combination of Jehovah, Ra, which is the Egyptian god of the, god of the sun, and Baal, which of course was the fertility god of the Canaanites. Yeah. So that that's who they've been worshiping all. All this time. I have a correspondent who has done research and said that there are continuing Baal worshippers. Yes. Now they, they view the sources of ancient pagan religion, Egypt, um, and elsewhere, Greece, to be equal sources of divine revelation that Jesus gave them. And Muslims, they gave them the light. So it really yes. doesn't matter if you have Jesus yes. or not. And I yes. cannot, for the life of me, see how you can be a Mason. I can see how you could be in there and be ignorant and uninformed and view it as a boys' club and a place to do business, you know, place to associate and have friends. And yet, once you're educated on this thing, I cannot see how you can stay in it. How can you be a part of something where you, you everything is secret? We're, we're open, yeah. transparent. Now, there's times when we want to keep a secret, a family secret, perhaps, or perhaps in a church where you there may be counseling going on that you know is between yeah. you know a few elders. Um, yeah. Is not revealed, but by and large, we are about being open and truthful. Yeah. And now, why would you want to keep the name of God secret anyway? You know, surely you want people to know about God. If yes. he means anything to you, you want you want the whole, whole wide world to know who he is. Yes. Well. Right. And Fennec belongs to... A, I've got it in the last, in the show notes in the last one. Uh, Burroughs something, hyphen something. He, and in a private handwritten note to one of my reporters said that Freemasonry is the handmaiden of the church. Now, yeah. he was raised by a father. Fanick admits his father was a senior Mason. Yeah. 
that raises the question with me as to whether he was a crippled theologically growing up. Um, and from Arthur K. threw out there that this is probably why Fanick didn't like guys like Chuck Smith and Arthur Bentley Taylor because they had the old theology that talked about sin and redemption and justification by faith only. Those are sharp words and a sharp message that would not comport with this broad universalistic religion. Yeah. So and maybe they maybe they also didn't get the appropriate handshake when they met. Yeah. <laughs> And, and now we got Cyril Milner in there and Bishop Powell. And Frank Vaughn. And Frank Vaughn. We need to mm -hmm. verify that. What what level was Frank Vaughn? Do you know? I don't know. Yeah. I know that before when you first step across the threshold, you make a pro solemn promise not to speak or yeah. write. And that goes into all these details, not in anything that could be transmitted, but syllables or words to reveal yeah. none of the secret arts, signals, signs, ciphers, or content. And that is completely, to ask a young novitiate, that is completely unbiblical. And yet yeah. we believe in oaths appropriately in court or yeah. when I was uh, promoted in the Navy and raised my hand as defend the Constitution, but it wasn't a secret. It was yeah. done publicly and openly. The, the other thing that's perhaps even more subtle is that, you know, by rejecting um, people who are faithful to the Scriptures and are trying to, to teach the Scriptures, they're making more of the Masonic Brotherhood than they are of the Brotherhood we have in Christ. That, that, that's that, that's a very serious yeah. thing to 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 place your your uh, emphasis on some man-made organization over and above the unity we have in Christ is a is a, a very dangerous thing to do. Well, that's one of the things. It rejects the antithesis between the believer and unbeliever. Those in yeah. Christ, those not in Christ, it yeah. blurs all of that. And that's another thing, yeah. the universal fatherhood of God, the universal brotherhood of man, without that redemptive difference. Yeah. That's another problem with them. Yeah. And a lot of this, I think, explains Fennec's weakness. Um, this guy, and it may explain some of his sociopathy, that he just doesn't care. Um, yeah. And, anyway. and also may, maybe it explains some of his so supposed strength as well, because he, um, he finds his uh, security in masonry rather than in the church. I mean, yes. And it also explains that trip excuse me, of two police officers to Brett Murphy's house yeah. and yeah. the refusal, they were in uniforms and with a police car and their yeah. refusal to identify themselves or give their badge numbers to him. Yes. You know, had, had the whiff of here's Fennec 50, 60 miles away driving into the constabulary of of Morkham and showing up with a couple of police officers. Yeah. Uh, Arthur K has asked Fennec about it, but he's denied it. So Fennec's a liar. Yeah. Well, um, I've had my suspicions about the Charity Commission as well, because it um, doesn't matter what you tell Charity Commission about Fennec, they cover for him. Repeatedly, they cover for him. Okay. and refuse to get involved. And you want to ask yourself, well, you know, are they allowing some sort of Masonic loyalty yes. to um, make them neglect their duty, which is to safeguard charities? Yeah. I didn't even think of that angle, but...
Yeah, the Charity Commission is um, is almost as uh, reprehensible as, as Fennec in the way that they allow Fennec to um, ignore the requests of the trustees of the the church charities. I mean, we're we're all um, we're all trustees of charities insofar as we are responsible to the public and to the charity commission ultimately as to how we uh, solicit funds and how we use those funds. And um, we pointed out to the charity commission on several points that uh, Fennec has just ignored those charity uh, requests of uh, the central trust. They are the uh, custodian trustees and they're supposed to comply with any lawful request of the local church trustees. And repeatedly in our situation here in Leeds, the uh, Charity Commission have um, been informed that um, Central Trust have ignored our requests. Um, and one wonders, you know, how, how do they get, how, how does that come about? <laughs> and one, one can't help thinking that there is some sort of um, bond there between Fennec and uh, and the officials within the Charity Commission, you know? That might explain the Jordans, Trevor in particular, who turned over all the accounts to the Lancashire Police Department and the investigation just disappeared. Yeah. He knows yeah. for sure that 20 or 30,000 pounds just went poof. Yeah, yeah. And I asked them for, um, we've got a law in this country called the okay. uh, Freedom of Information Act. And if you've got a vested interest in um, some or other uh, issue that's gone on between uh, a, a charity and a charity commission, if, you, if you've got some interest in that issue, you can, on the basis of that law, uh, demand... Uh, to know what the what the result was, and when when um, all that business with the money from Middlesbrough went on, um, apparently the charity commission, as part of its investigation, asked to see the uh, financial reports of the last uh, fifteen years or something. And on, on the basis of this law, I said to charity commission, "Can you please give me?" Um, sight of that um, uh, that request from the Charity Commission asking Central Trust to produce their financial accounts for the last 15 years. And they wrote back to me and said that um, they had no, they'd never had any response from the Free Church of England Central Trust. And they didn't have those records to share with me. I can't believe that that's true because um, they, they have to comply they're legally obliged to comply with the Charity Commission. If they ask to see their records, uh, Central Trust have to produce those records. They can't, they can't hide them from the, from the uh, Charity Commission. And yet when I asked for those records, they, they reported that, um, that they'd never been forthcoming, which I think is a, a dishonest uh, response as well. But, you know, unless you've got the financial backup to... Um, time and energy to, to uh, investigate these things or, or to bring it to court or whatever. They just get away with it, you know? Yeah. I'm wondering if Hunt is a Mason. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. If, um, if not, then uh, he's certainly um, he's certainly not uh, very forthcoming in in any way to challenge these things, you know. I mean, they must disturb him, surely. What, how on earth did he come to put all that money in his own personal account? And I think it was for a couple of years he did that. So he was drawing interest on that money. Four years is in his account. Four, four, four years. 300,000 um, pounds, which would be about maybe a half a million dollars here for four hundred thousand dollars maybe yeah at 
you know, depending where it's at, you might draw six or eight percent on a you know low, low count fund. So yeah, he there was money. I don't know what happened. Well, apparently um, he did comply to the extent of um, transferring it back into the central trust, but uh, only after he was challenged. So what what makes a man comply with a request like that unless he's in on, in on it all? Yeah. What do you do if you're an F? You know, there's only four churches up in the north nine churches down south or eight i mean they get on any given sunday between both south and north no more than 60 70 on a sunday is that right so i mean they're going nowhere fast have you heard anything more about um, what's going on in emmanuel no just that they're going on yeah, well, I, I, um, I've been trying to uh, encourage Brett to um, open up a little bit more, but he's um, he's playing his cards very close to his chest at the moment. Yeah, he's come under the ACT Philippines group, which has a, a, a diocese in England. That's where he's got alternative oversight. But it's it's Anglo Catholic, is it not? I think it is. Yes, yeah. they deny it, but they claim that they can come under them and not change a syllable of their founding documents. They can stay what they were. You know, they can be what is advertised on the tin. They can. Yeah. And. Uh... Are they part of um, GAFCON, do you know? Yes, they are. They are. Yeah. Well, G GAFCON, the GAFCON primates met on the 30th of last month. So we're waiting to see what, uh, what comes of that, if anything, re relating to the Free Church of England. Because Fennec wasn't invited to that, or was he invited and he refused to go, or something like that. Yeah, there was confusion on that. One report said they didn't want him. Another bishop on the record said he was invited but declined to go. Uh, right. I, I'm told that the entire FCE is on total lockdown. Not yeah, it sounds like it to be. But that's, yeah. that's what I think um, is making Brett so... Um, uh, so... so uh, uh, backward in coming forward, he's he's um, he's friendly enough, but he doesn't actually tell tell me he doesn't answer any of the questions I've asked him about about the church and w what they're doing now and whether they're even meeting or what what's happening. Yeah, they're meeting just like they were before, just as if none of this happened. Oh, good. Same well, that's good news. Same services. That's good news, but. Uh, but it'd be good if they um, were a little bit more open with us then, if that is the case, you know. If, they, if they've if um, they rejected Fennec's leadership, why don't they draw closer to us? Good question. Uh, uh, sure, surely there, there is um, a, uh, a common uh, factor there, a common denominator that we... We want to be the faithful, true, free Church of England members. And why did the ACT not join the FCEEC or FCE? Why did they in the 90s establish a little tiny outreach diocese in England? What did they disagree with all of you on? Yeah, I, I'm not aware of that. Um movement at all did it take off did it did it go anywhere yeah well they've got ten, uh six churches just approved recently okay and four more are going through the evaluation process which Here in england 
Yeah, here in England, which includes criminal background checks and safeguarding checks and so forth. So mm -hmm. I expect to hear favorably that there's four more. Um, and a few of those are ex-FCE ministers that have joined. So mm -hmm. there's no doubt... Well, Fennec where are the, where are these people though? Uh, they, do they um, I don't do they know. identify with anyone else, or are they just uh, sticking to themselves? <laughs> I don't know locations or names. One of them is Adam Scholes up way up north, an independent uh -huh. work who knew right. Um, right. Okay, that name rings a bell. I, I know that name. Yeah. He was actually um, in Middlesbrough for a short time, and he was also asked to look after a little um, kind of uh, mission church in uh, Barnsley, which is near Sheffield. Yeah. Adam Scholes, yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, let's close in for a Pardon? Yeah. You carry on there, Don. Okay. Close us in prayer. Thank you. Almighty, Almighty triune God, you're the God of truth. You are the God of light. Shine upon us this day that we may pursue the truth and speak the truth. Correct us, O Lord, where we are wrong. Guide us in the path of righteousness and holiness all the days of our life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'll see you what, Wednesday? Yep, that, that'll be fine. Um, Wednesday, 3 o'clock will be fine. And uh, just to mention for your prayers, uh, Don, we are meeting on the 28th, November 28th in Workington uh, for our convocation. Ah, okay. Sounds good. So if you want to join us online, that'll be good. If I can join online, I will. I'll send you the link. Ah, okay. Sounds great. I'll keep I'll sit to the side, of course. Great stuff. Be nice oh. to have your fellowship. You bet. Okay, Graham. Okay. Talk to you later. God bless. Bye. Bye.